we're mostly in and settled, so let's uh, let's get started again. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In reviewing all of the possible themes that I could have chosen from Great Lent, uh, this one, humility, seemed the most obvious to me, right? Going back to the, the, the dark robes, the somber services, the things we say, right? But at the same time, humility out of all of the four, uh, as I took time to meditate on each of these, this one was the one that pulled me in probably the most unexpected directions. The prominence of humility, especially during Great Lent, is obvious. Humility, humbled, humble, all of its related forms. Those words are some of the most repeated words throughout the Triodian. Flip open to almost any page and you're probably going to find an instance of one of those, okay? I imagine that if we did one of those, uh, those word map thingies, right? And no, sorry, here I'm not going to impress you having put together one of those for all of the Lenten Triodia, and I did not have time for that. <laughs> but if we made one of those for the Triodia, and I imagine one of the largest words would be humility. Here's just a few prime examples culled from the Triodian. Well, now it's not gonna work for me again. Let's see here, there we go. <clears throat> Every good deed is made of no effect through foolish pride while every evil is cleansed by humility. In faith, let us embrace humility and utterly, utterly abhor the ways of vainglory. And then just a few pages over. From the dunghill of the passions, the humble is lifted up on high, while the proud-hearted suffers a grievous fall from the heights of the virtues. Let us flee from his evil ways. Here's a few more, maybe. Here's another. The Lord of all has taught us in a parable to shun the boastful thoughts of the evil Pharisees. I'll give you one guess what week this is from. <laughs> he has instructed all of us not to think more highly than we should. He himself became our pattern and example, for he emptied himself even unto death upon the cross. Let us therefore render thanks with the publican and say, O God who has suffered for us and yet remains impassable, deliver us from the passions and save our souls. And finally, the word who humbled himself, even to the form of a servant, showed that humility is the best path to exaltation. Every man then who humbles himself according to the Lord's example is exalted on high. And we could multiply examples. These are just some prime examples I pulled from the text. There's, of course, the explicit request for humility alongside chastity, patience, and love in the prayer of St. Ephraim. Right? Give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to thy servant. There's St. Ephraim enacting his own prayer. <laughs> There is humility in the oft-repeated, in fact, the most repeated psalm, Psalm 50, right? The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Another word for that is a humbled heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. And that psalm, if we've not noticed, forms a kind of shape to the three hymns that we sing after the gospel throughout Lent at Matins, right? Um, oh, there we go. We got some people doing prostrations there. Oh, I guess I didn't put it in here. The gates of repentance do thou open unto me. Right? That begins one of our, our hymns after the gospel. The next one begins, guide me on the paths of salvation, O Theotokos. And the third, as I, the wretched one, ponder the multitude of evils I have done. We will come back to this. As that last hymn reminds us, throughout the period of the Triodian, we frequently recall the connection between humility and our sin. And here I'm going to take a quick sidebar. It might not be immediately apparent, right? The connection between humility and our sin, right? Until we remember the connection between humiliation and humility. Okay, I know we're treading on 
Very perilous ground here, right? And we talk about shame. But our sin indeed humiliates us, right? Or given the, complica- the complications between that word humiliation and shame, perhaps a better word is our sin humbles us, right? Consider the words of the canticle of the three holy youths while in exile in Babylon. For we, O Lord, have become fewer than any nation and are brought low, right? Humbled this day in all the world. Why? Because of our sin, right? We can be humbled by many things, right? We can be humbled by a life-altering sickness. We can be humbled by a spell without employment, an accident, or even a close call in an automobile, Or we can be humbled by other simple reminders that we are fragile and small. Um, A favorite of mine, a long trip in the wilderness, right? Uh, Leaving us aching and gasping for breath. Or as I was writing this, this should be familiar to all of you as well, a snowstorm that brings all of life to a screeching halt. No, this was not just a week ago in Fargo. This was several years ago when we had a major storm. Suddenly, in moments like this, we are reminded of our limitedness, our fragility, and our lack of resources. Sometimes the circumstances of our life do it for us. They humble us, as in the case of the prostitutes and the tax collectors that are our examples in Great Lent. Have you ever wondered why that's the case? Right? It's probably why they are our role models here. And why our Lord says the publicans and the harlots are going into the kingdom before you. Because they don't need to do the work of intentionally humbling themselves. Right? Their circumstances, their lot in life, their occupations have already done it for them. And so our sin, too, can have that effect of knocking out our feet from under us, of debasing us. And here, with that word, the word humiliate would be appropriate, of bringing us low. And this is, of course, a tragedy, right? That we must be brought low by our own decision to break relationship with others, right? To have a go at things ourselves and to make a royal mess of it. But it does happen. But we can choose to humble ourselves as well, okay? And the church gives us many opportunities during Great Lent to do just that, Right? Oh, there's our harlots and our tax collectors that are our examples throughout the Triodian. Oh. All right. We sing, let us prepare to debase ourselves by fasting. I didn't have that one in my talk until I think it was a week ago. We heard that at Vespers for Sunday, right? Let us debase ourselves by fasting referring to how we will bring ourselves low by the diet that we will soon take up. And the honest confession of our sin also helps us to get low, identifying with and bearing our humbled and even our humiliated state unto Christ. Right? This gets back to bearing that shame that Father Stephen Freeman speaks about. And the significance of this cannot be overstated because Christ describes himself as one who is gentle and lowly, as one that is humble in heart. And so back to our examples of humility in Lent, our Lord demonstrates his humility by the washing of the disciples' feet in Holy Week, where we meditate on the paradoxical juxtaposition of master and servant, of greatest and least, of glory and humility, but all in order to get us to ready to behold the greatest image of humility, right? That of his passion. Here is the icon of Christ that is actually named extreme humility, right? Which serves as an aid to meditation on that very thing. Here he is depicted as one entombed and bearing the marks of his suffering and crucifixion. More on this in a bit. 
But also I believe that of a great number of spiritual themes that we could choose to meditate upon, humility is probably the one that we get wrong most often of all of them. (laughs) My goodness, do we get humility wrong, right? I think most often we think of humility as low self-esteem, right? It's about taking that high regard in which we hold ourselves and replacing it with low regard. (laughs) Well, at its extreme end, that can become self-hatred, self-loathing, and despair. It's no surprise also then that this is also often linked to that comparison game that we've already brought up, right? Comparing ourselves to others, judging ourselves not enough in comparison to someone else. But humility is not about thinking yourself a worm, much less is it about hating yourself. It is not low self-esteem or low self-regard. In fact, much of this type of thinking actually stems from the opposite of humility. Think of it for a moment. It stems from pride. When we think that we should have been able to do something, right? We think that we should have been some kind of spiritual or moral adept and we were unable to reach that bar and we were incapable. Or when we have yoked our worth to some other mistaken notion of what a human being ought to be, right? So this is not humility. This is in fact Uh, a a, a stealthily cloaked form of pride, this low self-esteem, this low self-regard. The other mistaken way of thinking of humility that's also a cloaked form of pride has only recently been given a very accurate name. The humble brag, right? Are you guys familiar with what that is? Right, this is where you play act modesty. Right? Or you are self-critical, but all in attempts to actually draw attention to what are really admirable traits in you. Right? The classic example of this is the job interview, where the last question is, and what would you say are some of your negative traits or things you need to work on? Right? To which the applicant replies, well, sometimes I just work too hard. <laughs> right? I, I'm just too much of a perfectionist with my work. Well, we all know he's using the question as an opportunity really to boast. Or I've noticed we have our own orthodox version of this, which unfortunately rears its ugly head usually around Great Lent, right? When he who usually signs his emails from Jeff now begins signing them, your servant, the most unworthy sinner, Jeff, as though we can out humble each other. Right? Humility is not the humble brag. Rather, it is to dispense with all preening, posturing, pretending, and in our age, posting about it. Our most prominent example of humility is that of the parable of the publican and the Pharisee, which we encounter, of course, four Sundays before Great Lent begins. If you were in church, you heard it two weeks ago. But as I stated in my opening remarks, these images drawn from Luke make up the material of the preparatory Sundays before Lent, but they also return to us in Lent as the themes of the weekdays. And so Luke 18 and the publican and the Pharisee are also the theme of the fourth week of Great Lent as well. Pretty deep into the fast. The point of this parable seems to be... We're all still learning what it means, even as we go through this and rehash it every year. The point of the parable seems to be, and seems to me to be, that God can do very little with someone who is so thoroughly enamored with himself that he hardly needs saving at all. Or maybe he just needs a helpful assist from God, right? A strategy here, a discipline there. Otherwise, I'm good to go. God can do very little with the imagined person that we have in our head, right? And who is that? That's no one. (laughs) About who we could do or who we could be with just enough spiritual effort, with just enough time to do my prayer rule the way I want to do it. But God can do so much. And God hears the prayers of those who see themselves as they truly are. 
those who are willing to deal squarely with what they've got on hand in terms of abilities and resources, which is never much for us as human beings. Who is this type of person who is not nursing fantasies about who they could be, but is rather facing up to who and what they are. Thomas Merton describes humility, and I, I love this. Keep this one in mind. Thomas Merton describes humility as being precisely the person you actually are before God. You and I stumble through life, fostering plenty of illusions, right, about ourselves, <laughs> about our abilities, about our capabilities, about the basic goodness of ourselves and the basic rottenness of everyone else, right? <laughs> In the immortal words of George Carlin, ever notice how everyone driving slower than you is an idiot and everyone driving faster than you is a moron? <laughs> There's an important spiritual truth hidden there. We foster illusions about what we can do or what we think we should be able to do with the strength and the time we've been given, though both of those things are limited. And so humility is the state of being thoroughly disillusioned with ourselves. It's getting real with ourselves, dispensing with the illusions and seeing ourselves with deep integrity. It's also why I like to pull out another word for this that seems appropriate, and that is sobriety. Humility is sobriety clear-eyed vision about who and what we really are. Which leads us to another connection, and a very important one. That, be, that, that exists between humility and what it is to be human. They share the same root. When we look at all the words that share the Latin root, hum, hum, I'm sorry, I'm not a Latin scholar. <laughs> Ryan, maybe you can help us out. Hume, thank you. We arrive at the neighborhood in which humility resides. Humanity, humane, and then on the other side, exum, <laughs> posthumous. All these words are related to what it is to be human, which also reveals another important connection. Another word which shares this root, hume. Humus or hummus. And no, I don't mean that favorite Lenten food. I mean the ground, right? Hummus as in soil or dirt. This is the meaning of the root hum, ground or soil. Suddenly it begins to make sense why we spend so much of our time on the ground during Lent, right? <laughs> Pressing our foreheads to the ground, making prostrations to the ground, asking for forgiveness from the ground. And it's also why we hear all of the agrarian and farming allusions in the Lenten psalmody, right? The references to furrows and plowing. It's not just because it's that time of year for the farmers among us. It's that too. But there's something more elemental going on here. And it's also why the meditations on Genesis right? Because our connection with the ground is greater than most of us care to remember. When we go back to the stories of Genesis and the very beginning, we recall what we are as human beings. Adam from Adama, in Hebrew meaning earth, right? Ground, is created when the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man, the human being, became a living being. We are, as a species, quite literally in spirited earth. And yes, I know this is also the, the creation of, of Eve here, but I wanted to in, involve all of us to make clear, clear I'm talking about the human being, not just the male of the species. <laughs> And so it is this aspect of humility, which I think is at its core, that I'd like to call our attention to, its connection to what it is to be human. Because the more I read about humility, the more I realize the connection between it and our humanity. 
Humility is not ultimately about becoming subhuman, right? Thinking yourself a worm, worthy of loathing, something like this. But nor is humility about becoming something more than human, right? Somehow superimposing this extra trait or virtue, right? Adding humility as a badge to our spiritual Boy Scout sash. Do you have that in Canada? You have something similar? Okay. <laughs> Rather, I am convinced more and more humility is about becoming precisely more and ever more human, becoming fully human. Humility is to assume and to take responsibility for our humanity in all of its beauty, right? Its original created goodness and its mystery, but also in all of its brokenness and brokenness because of human sin, because of my sin included. Humility is about not thinking too highly of ourselves or of what we are capable. It means taking honest stock of our humanity which is to be finite, fragile, and dependent. And I'm going to come back to those words again and again. Finite, fragile, and dependent. Right? Humility is to accept and inhabit our creaturehood, which in many ways is the exact opposite of what Adam and Eve chose. Right? The opposite of what we want to believe about ourselves but also the opposite of what is at the root of all sin, pride, right? It's to not accept who we are as creatures made in the image of God. Humility is to soberly accept what is the truth about what we are, that we were never meant to be parted from the giver of life, that we rely upon him for our life and our salvation, that we are finite, fragile, and dependent, but those need not be liabilities, <laughs> and the mess that creatures like us have got ourselves into apart from God. And I know this runs entirely contrary to the spirit of our age, right? Which is really just in the last throes, let's hope the last throes, of a long modern obsession with human progress and its achievements, right? It's manifest in so many ways from the hectic and impossible schedules that we set for ourselves to the unrealistic standards of beauty and physique that we worship. From the age-old work to stymie age and failing bodies to the mistaken belief that somehow we'll simply technologize ourselves out of things like catastrophic ecological collapse. Uh, just the other day I was reading an article in, in Popular Mechanics of all places about uh, transhumanism. I don't know if you guys know what this is. It's this magical technological thinking that mankind will soon exceed even its bodily limitations, even exceed death, right? Uh, uh, by taking advantage of technologies that would be implanted in the brain and cell conditioning and all that. Talk about the extremes of human pride. <laughs> and that's just one extreme example, but we can all think of ways in which we personally imagine in our pride that we are, or that with enough hard work, effort, and strategy, we can exceed what we actually are. That we can be somehow exceptional. All of this is the opposite of humility. This is often manifest in confession. Father Ryan and I were talking about that on the way over where parishioners are frequently dismayed that they continue to struggle with the same sins year after year after year, right? As though they should be coming up with new and innovative ways to sin, right? That's what I always wonder, like, please don't do that. <clears throat> the fact that they continue to struggle with the same things is shattering the image of who spiritually they feel they should be. And that's a good thing. That's exactly the point, because they're not dealing with who they actually are. What should confession do other than to help us to an honest and sober evaluation of ourselves, which is decidedly un indistinguishable and unexceptional, which falls into the same ruts again and again precisely because we share a common broken lot stemming from our common propensity to sin? which leads us to another nasty thing that all this distinguishing and thinking ourselves exceptional does. It divides and it excludes. 
right? If we think ourselves more than human or capable of it, that means we think others less than human, or in the very least, less than us, right? If instead, humility drives us back to what it is to be a human being, it also inculcates in us a sense of solidarity with our fellow human beings, right? It breeds empathy for what it is to be human. And so, what if we took Great Lent as an occasion to remember that we are human? It's a simple suggestion, but I think a powerful one. Father Thomas Hopko, again of blessed memory, wrote a beloved list of 50 maxims. You're probably familiar with these, uh, by by which every Orthodox Christian should live. As I understand it, he carried around a notebook and he collected and compiled them over a long course as a teacher and pastor and leader in in the OCA. At their core are 50 or 51, 52, I think there are in all, short, pithy sayings to help guide Christian thought and behavior. And among these, perhaps my favorite one is the following. Be an ordinary person, one of the human race. (laughs) Man, that's some advice we all need, isn't it? Again, something deeply contrary to the spirit of our age, which is always telling us to distinguish ourselves, make yourself exceptional, or in the words of the teacher and writer David Dark, hurry up and matter. (laughs) But Lent reminds us it is enough to be human. God created you a human being. You grew up as a human being. You will live your whole life as a human being, and someday you will die as a human being. Some of what it is to be a human being is great. Some of what it is to be a human being is terrible and heart-wrenching. And some of it just is, right? There's the Tuesdays and the Thursdays of existence. But between now and your inevitable death, you will experience a long succession of what it is to be precisely finite, fragile, and dependent. Don't turn your Christian life into an attempt to escape from those things. Because those things are exceedingly important. Not only because God has created you this way as a human being, finite, fragile, and dependent. Not only because you will live your whole life as these, Not only even because it is as these that you are loved by God, but also because they are precisely what God has chosen to use to reveal himself to us. Right? These things that are so foreign to our ideas of God. Right? Again, our ideas are getting us in trouble. (laughs) Right? Human finitude, human fragility, and human dependence. Of course, God in his divine nature is none of those things. He is not finite, fragile, nor dependent. But by assuming those things, by making those things his own in Jesus Christ, he has shown us that he is humble. And think on that for a moment. God is not finite, fragile, or dependent. But by assuming those things, he shows us that God is humble. That's amazing. Let's return to to one of those lines from the Triodion that I quoted at the top. Oh, never mind, it's not there. I'll read it to you. The word who humbled himself, even to the form of a servant, showed that humility is the best path to exaltation. Every man then who humbles himself according to the Lord's example is exalted on high. If humility is where God reveals himself to us, right, in human nature, and where he goes in order to transform the mortal into the immortal and the corruptible into the incorruptible, and by what? By human death then humility has been mysteriously incorporated into the plan of salvation. And so so these things, to be finite, to be fragile, to be dependent, are absolutely necessary 
If you and I are going to come to learn that we do not have life in and of ourselves, if you and I are going to receive salvation from God as we were meant to receive it, we too then must learn to depend for life and existence upon God alone, which is what it is to learn humility. <clears throat> we will need to learn of our own weakness, but also simultaneously of the greatness of God manifest in weakness. And this is that two-sided bit, I believe I responded to your question with after the last session, which we do not by shunning, but rather by embracing what it is to be human. When we do this, some interesting things happen. When we can manage to be simply a human being, right, a member of the human race, Things assume their proper order. We allow God to be God, and guess what? We can stop pretending we need to be God. <laughs> Whew! Isn't that a nice relief off the shoulders? <laughs> when we allow him to be creator, we accept our createdness. It allows God to work and to shape us when we can readily admit that we are clay. Next. <clears throat> It discourages the judgment of others. If you and I are finite beings, guess what? We are incapable of making watertight evaluations of others. We simply are. We cannot do it. There's always some piece of the puzzle that's missing in our own minds and hearts or that we don't see. And when we take on a stock of who we are, how could we judge we would be ruling against our own humanity and condemning ourselves. And so humility opens our hearts to love. In fact, without humility, we cannot love. And finally, it redeems our relationship to the rest of creation. When we can recognize and accept that we too are created, that we are part and parcel to the rest of creation, it helps us to take seriously our role as stewards of that creation and also to repent of our failure to step into that role. Oh, sorry, that was not finally. I got one more. Finally and most important. Humility attracts God and communion with him. Elder Emilio Nos in his work, The Way of the Spirit, tells us that the more humble we are, the more God will reveal himself to us. And the more we know about God, the more humble we become, right? This gets back to that question about, you know, th these great saints that are so conscious of themselves as sinners, right? It's, it's that, that going to work on them. This is because God himself is humble. And so if we are following the example of Christ, humility will be the distinguishing characteristic of our life and the foundation of our relationship with God. We need all of the virtues. This is still Elder Emilianos. We need all the virtues, but without humility, they achieve nothing. But when they, the virtues, are joined with humility, we become the companion of God and enter the divine environment in such a way that, as we've said, we become gods ourselves. And so almost paradoxically, it is by becoming ever more human that we find what it is to be godlike. And this is because our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, embraced our humanity in all of its humility in his love for us in order to save us and reveal God to us. And so practically speaking, what can we do? What can we do to cultivate humility during Great Lent? Keeping in mind that humility has to do with remembering our finitude, our fragility, and our dependence. Well, I can think of lots of things, lots of practices we can implement, but chief among these things is fasting, right? There is perhaps no moment in the church year when we are more aware of our human bodies, their fragility, and their needs than during Great Lent. 
right? When the connections between our body and our soul are laid bare, right? And we, we realize that we're human by those things. Most of the year, we don't even think about eating, right? <laughs> we're hurrying up and mattering, or trying to, <laughs> right? And throwing some food down our gullet as we run. We don't recognize the connections between ourselves and what's on our plate. We don't recognize the web of relationships. What we eat represents between God and man, between man and man, and between man and earth. But fasting wonderfully serves to disrupt all of that, right? To throw it all into chaos and to force us to think about it. When we fast, we get hungry, duh, right? <laughs> That's kind of the point, to get hungry, to experience need and want at a bodily level, and to contend with these, and maybe the difference between those two things, need and want. To realize our weakness, our reliance, and maybe even to think upon our death. Uh, I remember uh, Father Seraphim Aldia, he's the Romanian monk that lives on the Isle of Mole in Scotland, uh, a wonderful uh, podcast on ancient faith, if you've not found it yet. Father Seraphim Aldia uh, at one point uh, said in a, th a three-part series on fasting, that's just wonderful, that fasting is a rehearsal for death. A rehearsal for death. I think he's right. Because so long as we are stuffing our gullet with food, we are laboring under the illusion that we're going to live forever. Simple as that, right? So long as we can continue eating, there will be another tomorrow. We imagine that we have life in and of ourselves so long as there is a grocery store nearby. <laughs> but when we fast we are made viscerally aware that we are finite, fragile, and dependent. We are reminded what precarious and contingent creatures we are. We know that what life we have, we receive from God and God alone. And hopefully this reminds us all of the dust from which we were made and of the dust to which all of us will return. All such grounded thoughts cultivate humility and then pave the way for gratitude and thanksgiving and maybe even for Eucharist, which is this act of receiving as human beings from God and then with thanksgiving and offering giving those things back to him with praise, right? It's highly significant that only human beings can offer the Eucharist, <laughs> right? We do this on behalf of all and for all, right? We make this offering. And maybe this rethinking or this thinking reorders some of our other things as well. Our relationship to other people and how we treat them. Do we see other people like our food only in how they are useful to us, as objects to use with utility, as those with whom we're caught up in a competition with, right? For love, for attention, for resources, whatever it is. Hopefully, when we remember the intrinsic goodness and God-givenness of food, our relationship to food changes, and the lessons learned translate to our wider life as well. We realize, in, in a word, our basic poverty as human beings. We begin to recognize that all we have, we have to receive from God, and we're all hungry for the same things. Hopefully that breeds empathy and understanding and patience and love, right? These things we call the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Hopefully it reintroduces a sense of unity and courtesy and humor, and maybe even compassion, right, between us. All human traits that we are sorely lacking in this era of, I can do it. I can do it, right? But what if you can't? What if you're not meant or created to make it on your own? What if you and I took to heart what it is to be created and dispensed with the lie that we can have life in and of ourselves? Well, I think that that just might create the space in which you and I and all of us might begin to be healed 
It might just provide God with the material he needs in order to breathe into it and make us alive. Thank you.